Hi, I'm Alistair. I make escape room games. And a few months ago in this channel, I described an escape room puzzle that involved rotating a set of discs so that matching symbols lined up along their edges. And the way this worked was very simple. Each disc has a single magnet on the underneath, and when they were rotated to the correct position, that magnet would be detected by a sensor mounted on the board behind, and that was connected to an Arduino controller. When all of the sensors detected a magnet, that meant that all the disks were rotated to the correct position and the puzzle was solved. So, in this design, there is no electronic hardware in the disks themselves. There's just a single regular magnet. And I got a message from someone afterwards saying, great puzzle, but what if you wanted to place LEDs on the disks to make the symbols glow when they're in the correct place? Um, you can't just put a wire through the centre of the disk to connect to those LEDs, uh, because these rotated continuously and the wires would get uh, tangled and twisted up as the disc was turned. And I said, well, that's no problem. Um, you could use a slip ring to transfer power and data to the LEDs on the front of the disc from the Arduino behind. And they said, what's a slip ring? And it was at that point that I realised that this is probably one of those components that some people might not know exists, or maybe you do know it exists, but you don't know uh, that's what it was called or how to use it. So in this video, I'm making a new puzzle, um, somewhat similar to the last, in that it involves rotating components, magnet sensors, and a magnet mounted in the tip of this uh, sword here. But this time, I'm going to be showing you how to use a slip ring to connect electronic components here between two continuously rotating surfaces. So let me show you how this works. Here I've got a sword which has got a programmable LED strip running down the middle and there's a magnet in the tip here. And then around the outside I've got these runic symbols and under each of those is a magnetic sensor like this one. Now the sword can be rotated to point at the different runes and when it does the magnet triggers the sensor which is detected by an Arduino and that plays a sound effect and it also sends a chase pattern to the LED strip. And the different sensors send different chase patterns. So they can be different colours, different length bars, different speeds. And what that does is it allows players to associate these different runes with a number or a colour or even a sound effect to place them in an order and that can be used as the basis for a cipher puzzle or a combination lock. So let me show you how this puzzle works, and it's based on this slip ring component here. So you can see it's a small cylinder with a bunch of wires on one side, and these are fixed in place. But they're connected to matching coloured wires on the other side, and these are mounted inside a smaller cylinder that rotates within the outer casing. Now, slip rings come with different numbers of wires and different ratings. Uh, this one has got uh, six wires at uh, 26 AWG diameter. So that's capable of carrying about 2 amp current at 240 volts, which is plenty for my little LED strip. So I have the slip ring inserted here at the pivot point around which the sword rotates. And then I'm using three of the wires to carry 5 volt ground and data to the LED strip. But I should point out that slip rings are not designed to be load bearing. So to support the weight of the sword itself, I'm using one of these Lazy Susan mechanisms instead. And you see the bearings on the side there. So that's actually going to take the weight of the sword. You can see it's got a hole in the middle of the mechanism there. And if I take my slip ring here and simply feed the uh, wires on one of the sides through that hole in the middle, and then I should just be able to pop this into place. So what is the diameter in the centre of that hole there matches the slip ring perfectly. So we've got the fixed wires on this side I can take to the Arduino. And on this side, we've got the mechanism that sort of support the sword and also the rotating wires that we can wire to the LED strip. 
and these can spin round and round with no risk of getting tangled and no additional strain on them because that's being taken by the lazy season mechanism. And now just let me spin this round to show you the reverse of the board. So here you can see in the middle I've got an Arduino Nano on a screw shield and that is wired to the six magnet sensors around the outside here. Then over here I've got a serial MP3 player that's connected to this uh, three and a half millimeter headphone jack and that's just going to an amplifier over there. In the middle we've got the slip ring and that's got three wires I'm using. We've got a five volt ground and the data line and they're going through the central hole there to the near pixels on the front of the sword. Now I appreciate it's a little bit hard to see from uh, this video angle so let me show you this wiring as a fritzing diagram instead. So here it is, I've got my Arduino in the middle here and below it I've got my six magnet sensors. Now you can see on one side of each of these sensors those are connected together and go through to ground on the Arduino and on the other side they're all connected to a unique GPIO pin on the Arduino. So I'm using pins 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and 7 but there's nothing special about those pins at all. You can use any available digital input pin on the Arduino uh, so long as it matches the definition that you put in the code which I'll show you in a moment. Um, and then over here this is my MP3 player module. Now in some previous projects a while ago I've used something called a DF player mini. Um, this is a slightly different uh, mp3 player module. It's quite similar but um, you might find it uh, easier to use. It's a little bit simpler if anything. So you connect an SD card into it and on your SD card you save mp3 or wave audio files and then you connect it to ground and 5 volts and you can trigger the individual sound effects from the card to be played through a 3.5 millimeter jack here that I've got going to an amplifier and a speaker. And you trigger those uh, using serial commands sent over this transmit line from the Arduino. Now uh, the Arduino on board has only a single hardware serial interface or UART as it's called. And the thing is we're already using that serial interface for the USB connection um, that we're connected to the PC. So to set up a, a second serial connection to send commands to the MP3 player here we're going to use what's called an emulated software serial connection. Now um, that's not as fast and it's not as reliable as using a dedicated hardware chip that we're using for the USB but it's absolutely fine if all we're doing is sending occasional messages that basically just say play this file or stop playing this file or set this volume level or things like that. So for just occasional low volume simple transmission of data software emulated um, serial is fine. And I'm using a library called Altsoft Serial to do that and that does uh, require particular pins to be used. So you need to use pin 9 as the transmit pin and pin 8 as the receive pin. And obviously what that means is this is transmitting from the Arduino on 9 so it goes to the receive on the MP3 player and in reverse this is transmitting here so it receives on 8 at the Arduino. Um, so that's uh, all there is to that. And then up here we've got our slip ring which is wired to our strip of WS2812B LEDs commonly referred to as NeoPixels. Um, so again these are connected to ground and 5 volts and they also have a single data line which I've got connected to A5. Uh, once again there's nothing special about that pin at all. You can use any available pin. You just need to um, modify the code to reflect the pin that you've connected it to. And the only point to know about here, so the inclusion of the slip ring doesn't change anything about the wiring at all. You can imagine this is just an invisible uh, box that the, the wires come out of the Arduino here and they arrive here. Nothing happens in between. 
And what that means is we still need to add all of the usual components we would expect to when wiring uh, this in. And for NeoPixels, there's two particular components you need to be aware of. The first one is you should place a resistor here on the data line, and that gets connected in series between the Arduino and the NeoPixel strip somewhere. It's best to connect it close to the, uh, the NeoPixel strip end if you can. Um, and this needs to have a value somewhere between 300 and 500 ohms. So I'm using a 330 ohm resistor, um, which is a perfect value there, and that's a very common resistor value as well. And the only other component to note is the capacitor here. Um, I mean, capacitors are, are useful in lots of circuits. You'll find that you don't always need them. Uh, it might work fine absolutely without it, but you will uh, benefit from it and you'll probably extend the life of your components if you place them correctly as well. So the point of the capacitor here is um, when all these LEDs turn on suddenly, they actually draw a surprising amount of power because each individual NeoPixel LED is actually uh, three LEDs in one. There's a red, a green and a blue. And each of those might draw, let's say, um, 40 milliamps of current when they turn on. So if you turn them all on full brightness, you've got three times 40 milliamps times however many LEDs are in your strip. That can actually be quite a, a large current uh, surge when you suddenly turn this on full brightness. So the capacitor, which I put here, you just put that across the power lines uh, with the negative uh, stripe here towards ground and the positive leg goes towards the 5 volt line here. And you put that somewhere across the power lines close to uh, the NeoPixel itself and when uh, those LEDs get turned on full brightness that capacitor will help supply uh, that current surge, that, that rush of current demand the capacitor will help smooth that out and it will make sure that the Arduino here hasn't suddenly got a, a big um, draw from its own 5 voltage here you see the capacitor acts as a kind of a, a reserve tank just to smooth out those um, sudden demands for, for current from the system. Um, so again, like I say, you'll probably notice it works fine without it. The more LEDs you have in your strip, if you have a longer strip or a denser strip that has LEDs closer together, that becomes more and more an important component. Um, and uh, that's really all there is. And now let's take a look at the code that's running on the Arduino. So there is uh, just over 150 lines of code here. And if you've been following my channel for a while, perhaps you've implemented some of my other escape room projects, what I'm hoping is that some of this might look quite familiar to you. Not only because I tend to structure my code in the same way, but because a lot of the functionality in this project is actually something I've done in previous projects. So we're controlling an LED strip, we're triggering sound effects, we're reading input from magnetic sensors. These are all things I've done before and I'm reusing a lot of the same code patterns that I did when I used them last time. And that's really, if you're new to programming or perhaps you're still learning programming, that's one of the things I'd love to be able to get across to you is that once you learn those patterns of how to uh, achieve a particular effect or how to process a particular input, you can reuse those same code patterns again and again in different ways and combine them in different ways to create a whole new escape room puzzles and props in the future. Um, so we'll step through uh, this code from, from the start anyway, but hopefully, as I say, as we go along, you might begin to recognize some things that you've seen before. So we always start with uh, the include section at the top. So this is where we're including extra code that's defined in third party libraries. And I'm using uh, three libraries here. The first one is fast LED, uh, which is used to interface to all sorts of programmable LED strips like the WS2812B strip I'm using here. Uh, then I'm using alt soft serial. Um, now, as I mentioned, this is to create the emulated software serial interface that we're using to uh, send and receive messages to the mp3 player. Um, you might have seen 
uh, some, uh, something called software serial used in other Arduino projects. So that's the built-in software serial emulation that comes with the Arduino IDE. Um, and you can use that. Um, Altsoft Serial is a better library. Um, and you can install it by going to Include Library, Manage Libraries. And then if I search for Altsoft Serial, it's uh, this library here by Paul Stoffrigan. Um, and it is more reliable, it can operate at faster speeds. The only downside is that you do have to use those specific pins 8 and 9 for receive and transmit, as I showed in the wiring diagram. And then I'm also using uh, this library here. This is a particular library for interfacing with the serial MP3 player I'm using. And it just defines some common commands like play, stop, set volume, and things like that. You could, if you wanted to, explicitly send those commands by printing to the software serial interface here, but it just uh, encapsulates it and makes it a bit easier to use with this library. Then we go on to our define. So we're defining the number of LEDs along the sword. I'm using 12 LEDs. That can really be any number of LEDs you want. The point of defining it up here is that we want our chase pattern to repeat and wrap around when it gets to the end of the sword. So it needs to know how many LEDs there are in the strip. Then we go on to some constants. So constants are um, values of variables that are not going to change throughout the duration of the project. So a lot of these are to do with which pins we have connected various components to. So I'm using pin A5 as the data line out that's going to my uh, LED strip. And then I'm defining six uh, magnetic sensors around the outside that the, the sword can point to. And those are connected to the following GPIO pins, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. As I mentioned, these can be uh, any pins you want that are available on your board. These were just convenient for me to, to get the wires to go to these ones, but you can really use any pins here at all. And then I'm going to define a couple of arrays here. And these arrays have one element for each sensor. So one element per rune, if you want to think of it like that. And this array here defines the colour values that each rune is going to generate on the LED strip. And these values generate the length of the bar that's going to be generated. So the number of pixels that's going to be filled in with the colour of this hue here. Now notice instead of using RGB values to define the colour here, I'm using a hue value. So I'm using the HSV colour system. And that means I can keep the saturation and the brightness the, the same for each rune. All I'm going to do is um, set the, the value through the colour spectrum here. So zero is a red hue, and then we're moving through into kind of yellows, uh, greens, and blues at the end here. And again, you can experiment just with different colours as to what looks good to you. Uh, now we get onto the globals. So globals are variables which are going to be shared throughout the project between different functions. So we have a global array of LEDs and these are the RGB values that um, the LEDs in the strip are going to be set to. So a bit confusing. The other I said I was using HSV values here and setting the hue. By the time we actually create the array to send to the LED strip itself we're going to be converting those into regular RGB values. And obviously we've got um, an array with one RGB value for each LED. So this is an array with number of LEDs elements in it. Uh, then we create our software emulated serial connection and we create an MP3 object that is based on that serial connection. If you happen to be using a board that has more than one hardware interface, so if you're using an Arduino Mega, for example, or if you're using an ESP board, um, you don't need to use the uh, software serial emulation here, you could create the mp3 object and pass in uh, serial 2 or serial 3 here instead and use the dedicated hardware chip if you want instead. Um, but if you're using a, an Uno or a Nano board that only have the one hardware interface, that's why we're creating the software interface here and we'll just point the mp3 at the software interface instead. And then we go on to the variables about the LED bar that we're going to create, that we're going to use in this 
chase sequence of flashing lights and we want to vary the property of that LED bar depending on which of the symbols the sword was pointing at. So the various properties we're going to change are how far along the uh, strip of LEDs it is, how far it's going to move on each frame, so basically the, the speed at which the chase pattern proceeds down the strip, um, the colour, which we mentioned is going to be set up here, depending on which sensor was touched, the brightness, um, and also the length of the bar. Now these are all relatively straightforward. You can see they're all integer values. Uh, brightness is a value between 0 and 255. Length is a value between, well, theoretically 0 and up to the number of LEDs in your strip because you can't have a light bar that's longer than the number of LEDs you had. The only two I want to draw your attention to are the top two, which you'll notice I've called POS16 and DELTA16. Now, if you wanted to create the simplest version of this code possible, um, you could have the position of the LED bar just as an integer between naught and the number of LEDs down the strip, and every LED would either be lit at the specified hue or it would be not lit. And what that would create is kind of a a bit like a kind of a pixelated, uh, somewhat jerky view as the um, LED bar proceeded down the light strip, every LED would go from suddenly off to suddenly on and then when the bar moved past it it would turn all the way off again. So it kind of be a binary value of off or on for each LED. But um, you can actually create a much more aesthetically a pleasing effect, at least I think, by gradually fading the LEDs at either end of the strip up and down as the bar moves along. So rather than just turn on the LEDs to full brightness, we kind of fade them up and we fade them down. And I'm going to do that in sixteenths of a pixel value. So we're going to kind of um, define the position of the bar as it moves down the strip rather than just say how many LEDs down is it? It's going to start at the fifth LED down or the eighth LED down or something like that. We're going to think in sixteenths, so it's going to start at five sixteenths down the LED strip. And in a function that I'm going to show you a bit later on, we're going to deal with the special cases of the LEDs that are at the beginning at the end of the LED bar as it moves down because they're going to be lit a fractional amount. Uh, uh, in terms of 16th values to make that sort of nice faded edges. You can think of it a little bit like um, anti-aliasing or, or sub-pixel rendering. It basically is a, an aesthetic effect. It does make the code slightly more complicated here, but I think it uh, makes the end result look much nicer than just LEDs that are all the way on or all the way off. Um, and finally, we've got a little flag value here that just keeps track of was the sword over one of the magnetic sensors in the last frame or not? Um, and we'll use that to trigger the sound effect. We don't want the sound effect to continuously trigger while the sword is being held over a sensor. We only want to trigger it the very first time the sword moves over a sensor. And to know that, we have to know, was it over the sensor before and has it just become activated? So that's what we'll use that flag there for. Okay, then we go on to setup. So setup is the function that is called when the Arduino is first powered on and you normally use it to do all of your initialization and setting up of various hardware components. So first of all we would begin a serial connection and we print the file that we're uh, currently executing and the date at which it was last compiled. Um, this is one of those code patterns which I've mentioned and that I tend to use in all of my projects now. It's really useful when you've got a whole ton of Arduino boards lying around, as I often do, and you can't remember which one is running which code. It means that when you plug it into your PC and just turn on the serial monitor, it will print out the name of the program that is executing the sketch that's running on it and also effectively what version number it's running because it will tell you the date that that was last saved. So that's just a really useful little tip um, for helping you keep track of your different controllers. Um, and I should point out, so this is the regular serial connection. We've we've talked about serial connections a lot. This is the, the, the onboard hardware serial connection which is going to the USB port. 
um, we'll initialize the LEDs. So I'm using WS2812B strip, which is sometimes commonly referred to as NeoPixels. It's a very easy to get hold of uh, five volt LED strip that you can uh, just connect with three pins, just five volt ground and a single data line. There are other types of um, programmable strips available as well and the fast LED library will work with lots and lots of different sorts of strips. So if you have slightly different um, connectors, some of them have four wire connectors for example uh, with a separate clock line, uh, you just need to substitute this with the type of LEDs that you're using. Uh, we'll specify the pin that we uh, connected it to, so we define this up here, this is A5 remember, and um, no, oh, I've lost my place. Um, the WS2812B strips, the byte ordering there, are in green, red, blue order. Um, you might be more familiar with red, green, blue, um, but these particular strips are green, red, blue. If you try this code out and you find out that all the, uh, the color hues seem to be off, um, then that is something worth checking that you've defined correctly. It just specifies the order in which the colors are written. And we tell it the array of uh, RGB values that we're going to populate and also how many elements there are in the array. And we'll just set the initial brightness as well. Uh, then we initialize our sensor pins. So we loop over all of our sensors. Remember we've got six in the code here but you can change that to anything you want. And we initialize each of those sensors as an input pull-up. So in the diagram, you'll remember that the magnetic sensors were wired on one side to one of these GPIO pins, and on the other side, they're wired through to ground. So when they're activated by a magnet, what happens is that that switch closes, and the GPIO pin here, this sensor pin, will read a low reading because it's been pulled through to ground. When the magnet is removed, however, we have what's called a floating pin so it's not being pulled through to ground but it is not reading high by default either it's just a, a variable floating value so we need to give it a known state when the magnetic sensor is not being activated and that's what input pull up does for it it uh, uses an, uh, a resistor that's on the board on the tip of the arduino itself and when nothing else is being detected on this sensor pin, it's going to pull the uh, reading up to a high value to five volts. And when the magnet is activated, it's going to be connected through the ground and it's going to read low instead. Uh, and then the final bit of setup is to uh, set up our MP3 player. So we'll begin the software serial interface that we created at the top, and we'll begin with a board rate of 9,600 board. Um, like I said, that's not desperately fast, but we're not sending very complicated messages here. If you were connecting a serial interface to a device that was giving you a constant stream of data, um, I don't know, something like a, a GPS module, for example, um, where you've got this constant stream of bytes, then you'd need to worry more about the speed and the buffer size and things like that. But all we're doing here is really only triggering a sound effect perhaps only every few seconds or so. This is not a lot of data, so that's a plenty big board rate. We'll begin the MP3 library itself. Uh, we'll use synchronous mode. Um, so this is um, very simply means that when we send a command, we do it within the main program loop, and then we wait for the response before continuing. You can operate in asynchronous mode as well, which is where you send a command and you don't wait for the response to come back uh, you carry on your your program and then the, re the reply gets handled asynchronously later but that's a little bit more complicated to use um, so this is this is the simplest mode and it works out with you fine and we'll set the value at which we want our sound effects to play as well this is a value between 0 and 30 so i'm setting it to maximum volume here um, there's not much uh, difference here to be honest I'm taking the output from the headphone jack and plugging it into an amplifier anyway um, so this just sets the input volume to the amplifier at a given value and then actually I'm using that external amplifier to provide the sound in the room anyway. Now here is the function that's actually going to plot the appropriate RGB values for each of the uh, LEDs in the LED strip 
for this chase sequence bar that's going to move down the strip and it's going to light up uh, at a particular color it's going to have a particular length to it and it's going to move a pos uh, position down the bar and we're going to be thinking in sixteenths of a pixel um, so that we can get this smooth edged beginning and end rather than a sudden jerky uh, light on and light off. Uh, so what this function does, well having been given uh, a position in sixteenth of a pixel what we're going to do is we're going to divide that into the whole number of pixels by dividing by 16 and then we're also going to take the fractional part as well so what's the the remainder after having divided by 16 here this is an integer division here so this is uh, a little bit like rounding uh, down we don't need to put a round function because we're dividing by an integer anyway and then this will give us the remainder that will give us the, the two parts that we're using later um, now to work out the first pixel in the strip the brightness that that has to be well 255 is maximum brightness and at, depending on how much of a fraction the bar has moved we want to take away so the the first pixel is is uh, essentially the end of the line you can think of it the back of the line because it's the line that's f uh, closest to the center of the sword and our led strip is moving towards the tip of the sword so when i say first pixel what i really mean is the back of the line here so the larger the fraction that the bar has moved into the tip, the, f the more we want to take away from the uh, maximum brightness. And we're multiplying it by 16 because this whole function here is dealing in 16 sort of thing. So let's, for example, let's say we've moved halfway into the pixel at the end of the line. So in that case, our fraction is going to be a half. We'll take... Um, that turn that into sixteenths, and then we'll subtract that from the maximum brightness. So both the first pixel and also the last pixel are going to be half uh, brightness at that point. As the fraction increases, that means that the the last pixel, which is actually the one nearer the tip of the sword, that's going to be uh, a higher fraction, which means we want the first pixel to be a lower fraction. So we we take this off. It's, it's not very well explained, but I'm hopefully, hopefully that will make sense to you. Uh, essentially, we're talking about the two ends of the line gradually uh, fading up and fading down as the bar moves forward. And obviously, this is going to be the complement of whatever the first pixel was. We want them to add up to one, so we just take away the first pixel brightness from 255 for this one here. So that works out the brightnesses we want uh, for the first and the last one. Then we need to actually loop over each of the pixels and set the appropriate uh, value in the array here. So we loop over every um, every pixel that's in the light bar that we're trying to light up. So that's what the length will tell us here. If we're drawing a seven pixel long light bar, we're going to loop over all seven pixels. If it's the first one, then we set the brightness equal to the first pixel brightness, which we just uh, calculated up here. If it's the last one, then we'll set the last pixel brightness. Anything in between, we're going to set to full brightness here. Um, so it's only the it's only the first and the last one of these special cases. And I say this is a I've made this code more complicated than the basic examples you might see of how to light up lights on an LED strip. But just specifically to get this fading at the beginning and the end, just because I think it looks uh, much nicer. So don't worry too much if you don't understand all of this. You can just use it as it is and it will work for you. Or if you want to write your own code from scratch, um, you can make a simpler version without the need for all this. Um, this is only here just to get this, this nice fading at the beginning and the end of the bars, that's all. Um, and once we've, we've worked out what the brightness is, we actually assigned that value to the appropriate LED in the LED array. We go on to the next one. And if we get to the end of the strip, we go back to the beginning again, because that is a, a chase sequence that we want to repeat forever. And now we get on to the loop function. So this is the uh, the final function. And this is the main program loop that just uh, goes round and round and repeats forever for as long as the Arduino is running. And it uh, performs these actions in turn every time. So the first thing we do is we initialize a new variable that says is the sword currently over one of the sensors 
Now remember at the top we had a global variable that we called um, was over sensor. So that tells us was it over the sensor in the last frame. Now what we're looking at is is it over a sensor right now. And to determine that what we do is we loop over each of the sensors, we take a digital reading of the sensor pin and we see whether that is low um, because as I said earlier these are connected through to ground so when a magnet is present that means they're going to read a low value there. If it is what we'll do is we'll look up uh, the value from those arrays we defined at the top of the code. So we know that the ith sensor has um, been activated here so we'll look up the ith length and the ith hue and we'll assign that to the values of length and hue. So again just looking at the top of the code here um, so let's say the third sensor has been activated or the, the sensor with index 3. So we'll take, um, so this is the zeroth sensor, the first, the second and the third. So we'll take this value here, it will be that hue and we will take one, 0, 1, 2, 3, we'll take this length. And we'll take those values from the arrays there and we will assign them uh, into, where have I looked, gone? No, gone a bit too far down. Um, oh, so excuse me. There we go. There we go. We'll assign them into uh, length and hue here, and we'll also update the is over sensor flag that we declared here. We'll say it's true because the sword is over at least one of the sensors at the moment. Once we've looped over all the sensors like that, we'll now say, okay, well, if the sword is currently over the sensors and it wasn't over the sensors last time, that's what the exclamation mark means here. It means to invert. So this is not over a sensor last frame. Well that means that we have just moved the sword so we'll reset the position of the chase sequence. We'll set it to zero. That's the end nearest the middle of the sword and we will play a track from the mp3 serial player. Um, now you can look up various functions that come with this mp3 library I'm using. The only one I'm using is actually this play track command and you pass it the index number of the file on the SD card you want to play. Now in this particular case I've actually only put one sound effect on the SD card so it's always going to be the index one. But if you wanted to you could have lots of sound effects, you can have a different sound effect for each symbol or you could have a randomized sound effect to make it a bit of variety as, as the, um, the players played. Um, and in that case what you need to do is you need to number your sound effects on the SD card incrementally so call them 001.mp3 then 002.mp3 003.mp3 etc and then you call them by specifying the index number that corresponds to their name. Now some people have reported in the past that um, that doesn't always work and instead what happens is you actually get um, the number uh, according to the order in which the files were saved onto the card. So one will give you the oldest file effectively, two will give you the second oldest file. So um, to be safe either way the best thing to do is to copy all your files over in one go and have them named um, incrementally as well. And if you do that it shouldn't matter um, you know because the first file will be the first one copied on and it will also be the first numbered file as well. Um, I say this is very similar to, uh, to the DF player which I've used in uh, some other projects. Um, the main difference is that the wiring is actually a bit more straightforward because you don't have to deal with a, a resistor on the data line or capacitors or anything like that because they're built onto the board itself. Um, there we go and now so we're up to the if else statement here so we were looking at if the sword is currently over a sensor. If it's not currently over a sensor then what we're going to do is we're going to make the LEDs fade out. Now again I've made the code slightly more complicated here than the, the basic example. I could have just set all the LEDs off at this point but what I want to do instead is to make them fade out gradually because I think that looks more attractive. So we're just going to multiply the brightness by 0.8 and that's going to gradually reduce it uh, each frame until it reaches zero. Uh, this is just a safeguard, this line here, to say if we ever try to set a brightness less than zero, well that doesn't really make any sense, so let's just clamp that brightness value at zero um, and prevent ourselves ever going lower than that. And then we'll actually assign that brightness to the fast LED object itself here. Um, having done all that, 
we can update the flag so that we got the correct value for next time through the loop. So was over sensor in the next frame will be equal to is over sensor right now. And then what we're going to do is we're actually going to um, set these values into the RGB array of um, pixel RGB values. So we're going to clear out any values that were there last time. That's what memset does. It's going to set zero for all of the LEDs. So we're going to start with a fresh array. Then we're going to call the draw light bar function that was defined earlier. Uh, remember that was up here. And this is actually going to populate the array with the values corresponding to the current frame. So it's going to choose the correct color and the correct length of the light bar and populate the RGB values corresponding to that. Then we're going to move the chase sequence down the strip for the next frame. We're just going to advance the position by whatever we specified our delta was. If you wanted some of the strips to move faster than others, you could set different delta values depending on the um, sensor that was activated up here as well. Um, and again, we wrap around here. So um, once again, we're thinking in sixteenths of a pixel all the time to get that smooth effect. Um, so if we've exceeded the number of LEDs in the uh, strip, we start again from the beginning by just subtracting that value here. And that will just keep us from trying to access um, an array element that's outside the bounds of the index. And finally, um, we actually, so all up to here, what we've been doing is we've been setting the value of the RGB array. What draw light bar does, if we go back up here, remember we're setting the value in the LEDs array based on this calculated hue and brightness, based on the position and the length. All of this has set the array values, but it's not actually sent it to the LED strip yet. To do that, we always need to call fastled.show at the end of each loop. And finally, we'll just implement a slight pause before um, looping round again. We don't need this to run at the absolute maximum clock speed of the Arduino, so we're just gonna put a 10 millisecond pause before looping round again. Um, and that's all the code. So that just about brings me to the end of this video about these very useful little components called slip rings. And perhaps you knew about them already, maybe you already used them, maybe you didn't, but hopefully I've shown you some more ideas about how you can use them in an escape room puzzle. For me, escape rooms are all about that physical interaction and tactile components. So pulling levers, twisting cogs, pressing buttons, and spinning things around. Um, and this is just one way that you can make those kind of interactions more exciting for players by having electronic components like LEDs and buttons on those rotating surfaces. Um, as always, I will put the wiring diagram and the code that I used on the Arduino. I'll put those available to download on my Patreon page, which I will link below. Um, and I want to say thank you so much for the ongoing support of all my patrons who enable me to carry on making these videos. I do really appreciate your support, so thank you. Um, other than that, if you have any questions or comments um, about this or any of my other escape room projects, please do let me know in the comments below and I'll do my best to get back to you. Um, other than that, thank you very much for watching and I look forward to seeing you next time. Okay, cheers, bye.